If it matters to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Arts and Recreation Center in Caymana Bay. My name is Paul Biles, and I'm the President-Elect of the Chamber, and I'll be asking the questions to our candidates this evening. Since the 1980s, the Chamber of Commerce has held these candidate forums so that voters can meet their candidates and vice versa. All of the candidates of the 2017 election received invitations to attend their forum, and we would like to thank tonight's Georgetown North candidates for attending. With the implementation of one person, one vote system, and with 19 electoral constituencies now identified, it is more important than ever that the voters inform themselves on their candidates. Tomorrow, on Wednesday, May 10th, voter registration cards will be available for collection from Georgetown Hospital from 9.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Voters will require a valid form of photo ID to collect their voter cards. Voting locations have been updated to our elections page on caymanchamber.ky. I would like to thank the Chamber staff for their assistance in organizing these forums, as well as Hurley's Media for broadcasting the forums live on Cayman 27 and online. Special thanks to our corporate sponsors for their support, including the DART organization, Deloitte, Foster's IGA, Heritage Holdings, and Puritan Cleaners. Mr. Will Panu, Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber will be tonight's moderator. He will explain the rules of the forum and he will then introduce tonight's candidates. Good evening ladies and gentlemen, good evening candidates. Each candidate will be asked a series of questions that are prepared by the Chamber members and the general public. You'll have two minutes to respond to each question if you choose to do so. And one ring on the ringer of the bell indicates that you have 30 seconds remaining in your response and that the second, once the second bell rings, please conclude your thought. I will not rush you, but please don't uh, take too much more of that time. So each candidate will be allowed to answer the question without interruption. And at the conclusion of the forum, you'll be given a two minute closing statement. So um, again, thank you for participating. And what I'm gonna do now is gonna take a short break. And when we return, I'll officially introduce our Georgetown North candidates. Elite Marble and Granite exclusively introduces Santa Margarita Quartz. Elegant and resistant, Santa Margarita Quartz is the ideal surface for high traffic and everyday use. It can also be up to 25% cheaper than Caesar Stone and Sile Stone. Santa Margarita is exclusively by Elite throughout the entire Caribbean with the largest stock in Quartz. Call 945-9028 or visit us online at Elite.ky. Elite Marble and Granite, where perfection costs less. Some side effects of radiation can affect a patient's appetite. Here are some tips for maintaining good nutrition while undergoing treatment. Eat frequently. Eat small portions of calorie-dense foods. The goal is to maintain your weight while going through therapy. Concentrate on liquids and soft foods. These will be easier to swallow. Although it may become difficult to eat, try as best as you can to maintain good nutrition. Visit the local Cayman Islands office at Governor Square or call 749-3304. Waste Carriers is your complete waste management company. We service commercial, residential, and construction properties. With our large inventory of dumpsters and grapple truck services, we provide an unmatched, dependable service. Our sister company, Island Recycling, buys and collects recyclables such as AC units, aluminum cans, auto batteries, copper, and much, much more. For Cayman's waste and recycling solution, one call takes care of it all. Call 946-DUMP. That's 946-3867. Welcome back to the Arts and Recreation Center in Caymana Bay, where we have two of the three Georgetown North candidates in this evening's forum. I'd like to introduce our candidates for the forum. 
will be, I'll introduce them as they're seated. Ms. Karen Thompson is an attorney at law, who is one of the first students to be enrolled in the Truman Baden Law School. Her work as an attorney has, has seen Ms. Thompson develop and support legislation, including the protection of victims of domestic violence in 1992 and the Children Law in 1995, to name but a few. For her commitment to the Cayman Islands community, Mrs. Thompson was named Woman of the Year by the local chapter of the Business and Professional Women's Club. Mrs. Thompson is seeking election as an independent candidate for Georgetown. Good evening. Mr. Hugh is currently the elected member for Georgetown and a member of obviously the Georgetown District. He currently serves as a counselor in the Ministry of Tourism and Transport. During his time in the Legislative Assembly, Ms. Yu has worked on developing cruise tourism in the Cayman Islands, the expansion of the port, and the redevelopment of the Owen Roberts International Airport. He has served on many boards and organizations, including serving as Deputy Chairman of the Trade and Business Licensing Board. Mr. Hugh is seeking re-election as a Progressives candidate for Georgetown. <coughs> Welcome. I'll now turn over to Mr. Biles to ask the first question in the forum. Thanks, Will. Our first, que first question tonight focuses on the waste management issue. I'll start with Mr. Hugh. Are you in favor or against the government's decision to keep the Georgetown landfill at its current location? And or would you support establishing a properly managed facility in another part of Grand Cayman? Thank you, Paul and good evening to everyone. I am, I am in support of keeping or developing a integrated so solid waste management system in the current location. The government owns enough property there. Um, the plan that's in place, which we are well into the development stages, we are expecting contracts to be signed within the next couple of months, calls for a state-of-the-art recycling and waste to energy facility, which will actually reduce the, the waste going into any form of a landfill by up to 95%. One of the key reasons why we would want to keep it in that area is that we've already established that area as a collection point and the consumers for the energy produced in the waste energy plant are right there within the general vicinity. And that's important um, that we can transport the energy and be able to sell the energy created there at the facility. So I do support the facility remaining where it is. I think there will come a time after we have remediated the current sites and as we progress along that we will have to have collection and sorting depots in the different districts. But at the moment, the best plan is to keep it where it is. Thank you. Same question to Ms. Thompson. Are you in favor or against the government's decision to keep the Georgetown landfill at its current location? And or would you support establishing a properly managed facility in another part of the country? Having taken a position as a long-time resident of what is now the area that has been designated as the Georgetown North Electoral District, not only have I had the privilege of enjoying the benefits and the beauty that surrounds each and every resident of the area, I can safely say that like the vast majority, and this is where I differ from my good friend, Mr. Hugh, I have also been subjected to the, I hate to say this, ungodly sight of what is commonly referred to as Mount Trashmore. To be very frank, back in 1992, this issue was addressed by the then government and remediation in terms of the Georgetown landfill 
was an issue that drew the attention of all the residents in my general area. With the benefit of hindsight and the passage of time, I must say that it is my view, and I think I'm as qualified as any expert in the given field to say that we have passed the stage of effective, sustainable re remediation. I am in favor of having the landfill removed and placed elsewhere. I have no wish to encroach upon the good people of Bodden Town, but this is what I have to say tonight. If I have my say, if I have my way, no more dumping in Thank our you. backyard. Thank you. We'll start our next question with uh, Ms. Thompson, and this will focus on education. Yes. Education addresses several areas, including primary, secondary, tertiary, vocational training, and worse, workforce development. If you had to select only one area of education to focus on, what would that area be? Please explain why and how you would address it. I am of the strong view that primary education is crucial. Between the ages of 4 and 11, I am of the, again, view. And I think I'm a good example. And so is my learned friend. That if you don't have a solid base, upon which to proceed with secondary, and if you're fortunate enough, in many instances where you cannot afford to pursue tertiary, tertiary education, as was the case back in the early 70s, in my instance, um, if you don't have that base, that strong, solid base, from the primary level, it is very, very difficult to then focus on what follows from the ages of, say, 11, 12, and 17, when we would be moving on to tertiary education. So as far as I'm concerned, the focus must start at the very beginning, the early years. Thank you. Mr. Hugh, same question to you. Thank Edu you. Would you like to read the question or? No, that's fine, thank you. Okay. I just wanted to quickly um, go back to the first question and say that the, the reports have told us that the landfills cannot be mined and that the only way to deal with them is to remediate them in their current position. So that being the choice, that's the choice why we have, we've decided to, to remediate them and create the, the waste energy facility there. On this question, I would, I would agree that primary, the primary years are the important years. That, that, those are the formative years of our children. I think this is where we would have to focus on our early intervention. If we are going to have to keep a child back, those are the years that we would keep them back. Those are the years that, they would, that, that are important and that they would meet less teasing and, and less embarrassment from their peers if they have to be held back a year and we can work on them from there. I've always, I, I, you know, very often used in, in my business life and, and certainly in my personal life that if we, if we deal with issues early there, they become a diagnosis. If we wait too much longer, then they become an autopsy. So. The primary school years are the years that I feel that we have to put our focus on. I think those are the most important years where we start to mold them and form them into the types of students that we would like them to be. And if there are issues, then this is the best time to deal with them. Thank you. We'll start the next question with Mr. Hugh. 
Are you satisfied with the resources that have been allocated to the Royal Cayman Islands Police Force to maintain public safety in this area, Georgetown North? Am I satisfied? No. Um, and I say that, you know, overall, this government um, over the last couple of years have increased the police budget by around a million dollars. However, what we've not done is insisted on where these funds are, where these resources are being allocated to. We are now awaiting the plan from our current commissioner on his strategic plan, and we have committed to him that we will allocate further resources to him. However, we would like to know where those resources are going to be applied. Um, for the entire country, border protection, the coastlines are very important to us. We, we just received a report from the UK and we allocated just the other day, just a couple of months ago 500,000 towards repairing um, all of the vessels within the marine unit and to, all, and to also purchase one more vessel. And we anticipate that in the new commissioner's plan that there will be a lot more emphasis placed on our border protection to stop the import of illegal weapons um, and drugs, of course. And we have also indicated to him that we would like to see the return of the Seven Mile Beach Police Station and the Tourism Police. We feel that it's important that we show that there, or give the tourists, the tourists our guests, um, the safe peace of mind that there are police around. We would like to get back to where we have our beat officers on the bicycles along the Seven Mile Beach corridor in particular, and also the patrols along the beaches at night, just to stem um, the petty theft that we're currently seeing on the rise and to ensure that, that we can protect our resources and certainly the District of Georgetown North. Thank you. Ms. Thompson, same question. I think that this may be an area that both Mr. Hugh and I, perhaps one of the few questions you'll ask tonight, that we totally agree in that I am certainly not satisfied, not only as a resident of Georgetown North and as a resident, a long-time resident, in excess of 40 years, I am far from being convinced that sufficient resources have been set aside to combat what has now become an epidemic in terms of crime and gun violence in the area that I so proudly call home. As far as I am concerned, we don't have to go very far when we look at the recent shooting that took place within less than a quarter mile of where I reside and many of my neighbors and their children have expressed a feeling of constant fear for their safety. We must do whatever it takes and that includes allocating sufficient, adequate, I would add, resources in order to have properly trained, able, capable, and willing officers on the beat 24-7. And I will say this again, this is not an issue that we have to await yet another report from whether it's the new commissioner or the old commissioner. We have it. We face it every single day, every single night. And I think I need say no more insofar as my views and where I stand at this juncture in terms of the inadequate funding and the resources made available to date. We can't talk about two years ago. If not now, I ask you here tonight and my listening audience, if not now, when? Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Thank you. 
Our next question begins with Ms. Thompson and it focuses on healthcare. Healthcare costs have become one of the highest expense items in the national budget. What reforms, if any, would you propose to address this situation? Well, again, I think I've had in the last nine months um, far more involvement with our local health care on a personal basis than I would have liked. It is very, very obvious we have a public system of health care and the figures as to the debt accumulated over a period of time. And I'm very careful to say that because it, it's not my role at this juncture to seek to point fingers at any particular government as to the unholy mess that we now find ourselves in, in terms of um, affordable health care for each and every man, woman, and child that are blessed to call Cayman home. We have to address and recognize that we have two systems and we have to recognize that is the private sector and then we have the public, the Georgetown Hospital. Um, we need only look at the various figures um, provided through the PAC, the Public Accounts Committee, to see the state of affairs as it relates to our debt. I think we have to start by looking very, very carefully at what we have and in terms of how long we've had it, whether it's working, and it is, in my humble opinion, it hasn't worked and it hasn't worked for a long time. I remember cynical when it was brought into effect. It's Thank you. just not doing what it was supposed to do. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hugh, I'll repeat this question for the benefit of the audience, actually. Um, healthcare costs have become one of the highest expense items in the national budget. What reforms, if any, would you propose to address this situation? Thank you, Paul. I think there is definitely a need for reforming the ability to access and acquire health care and health insurance on the island. Um, I think it's, you know, the way we actually treat our elderly and those who um, suffer from long-term sickness in this country is, it's, it's embarrassing. You know, we, we, we hear the words about pre-existing conditions, we hear stories of persons having their insurance dropped at the times when they need it most. And this is something that has to be addressed. We're very much aware of it as a government. We intend to address it. We have been making efforts towards it. And I believe one of the ways to do that is to actually properly fund and staff Cynical that it can become a full-blown insurance provider offering not only health care insurance, but property insurance as well. These, this is, these are some of the ideas that we as a government are, are looking at, but we understand it, we feel it. When I'm in the community in, during the day and during my constituency clinics, the stories of elderly, the elderly persons who, are, who need health insurance and cannot get health insurance are sad and persons who are suffering from long-term illnesses and have been dropped by their providers. It's inhumane, and it certainly has to be addressed and reformed. Thank you. Our next question, we will start with Mr. Hugh, regarding the cruise birthing facility. Do you support or oppose the construction of a cruise birthing facility in Georgetown? If yes, how would you recommend that we pay for this facility? Thank you for that question. I guess after my introduction by Will, I would <laughs> I want to have one answer to that question. That is that I do support the construction of the cruise birthing facility. And, and it's important that I 
I also say that it's not just a cruise berthing facility, but the expansion of our cargo port, which we will outgrow within the next five to eight years if we do not expand that. The question that we all had to ask ourselves was, do we want to remain in cruise tourism? And there are thousands of Caymanians who participate in that industry, that rely on that industry. We, could, we, we look back to when we, a few years ago, when the numbers had dropped from 1.9 million several years ago, down to one point, just over 1.2 million. And again, you know, my constituency clinic was filled with persons losing their homes, losing their vehicles. There was chaos at the ports. And now that we have somewhat returned the numbers to just over 1.7 million, persons are now starting to rebuild their businesses and they now depend on that industry to feed their families. The reports clearly tell us that if we do not build these birthing facilities, that our numbers will again drop to around a million or below because we cannot tender the larger ships. The financial model that we, have, that we are developing for this is a model where we have ring-fenced all revenues that the, that the government currently um, get from cruise tourism, that being mainly the head tax on each arriving passenger. And we have proposed a financing model where the cruise ship, where several of the cruise lines have stake in the building of the piers, no upland development, and the way they will get their money back is from the replacement of the tendering fees by the berthing fees. And the berthing fees will then pay the cruise lines back and it also ties them in for the next 15 to 20 years that if they do not use the pairs, they do not get their money back. And that's my best answer in a minute and a half. Thank you. Ms. Thompson? Well, I'm very heartened um, to hear tonight about the anticipated growth in the portion of the proposed birthing facilities as it relates to cargo. I, I don't think that there's anybody here tonight that would not know that I would, and most of my family, my immediate family, would be very, very heartened to hear that we're going to have the growth obviously envisaged by my good friend who is speaking on behalf of the party that he represents and form a part of. I cannot in all good conscience, sir, support the proposed birthing facilities in terms of cargo and also in terms of our cruise ship visitors. I have again the benefit of watching those ships anchor. If I sleep in, I actually hear the chains as their lord. And we have to accept something next to our people, meaning everything came mankind. Our pristine waters, our environment, our sea life is exactly what has brought the bread and butter to the tables of thousands of our people. And if we look at the statistics, I am not at all convinced that what we are being asked to give up and lose forever is worth what we will lose by, in return. Well, that concludes the Thank first you. segment of questions. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back to the Arts and Recreation Center for more questions of our Georgetown, for our Georgetown North candidates. Please stay tuned. 
Elite Marble and Granite exclusively introduces Santa Margarita Quartz. Elegant and resistant, Santa Margarita Quartz is the ideal surface for high traffic and everyday use. It can also be up to 25% cheaper than Caesar Stone and Sile Stone. Santa Margarita is exclusively by Elite throughout the entire Caribbean with the largest stock in quartz. Call 945-9028 or visit us online at elite.ky. Elite Marble and Granite, where perfection costs less. The Gillette World Sports Show is all about reinventing the way we look at sports. This program will check out the biggest global sports action from a different perspective. From technology to training to cutting edge science. Don't you just love that feeling? You gotta get everything you have. It's about precision and the difference between winning and losing. Tune in to Cayman 27 Saturdays at 7 p.m. and Mondays at 1 p.m. for Gillette World Sport. C3 Pure Fiber broke the Caymanian record of the first 100% fiber optic network. Do you know what it feels like to be fiber fast? It feels like this, like your whole life passing beneath your fingertips, like your world is living with you, like everything in your whole life is always connected. We are a new breed of connectivity and we are ready for you. TV from 59, internet from 69, bundles from 89, and home phone from 9. Join us today, 333-3333 or c3.ky. Welcome back to the Arts and Recreation Center where we have two of the three Georgetown North candidates with us this evening, Mrs. Karen Thompson and Mr. Joseph Hugh. We've just concluded the first round of questions and now more chamber questions before we turn over to audience questions after the next break. Thanks, Will. This question will begin with Ms. Thompson. What do you think of the current immigration policies regarding the granting of permanent residency, and if you are able to decide on policy changes, what exactly would you recommend? For a change, I'm going to be very, very careful in that, as most lawyers, if they don't know, they should know from their, probably their second lecture in law school. <clears throat> that the sub judice rule is one of the fundamental benchmarks of our justice system. And as we're all aware, there are a number of pending lawsuits, and I have no doubt that there are going to be a number, a significant number of other lawsuits. So when I answer this question, forgive me if I speak in very general terms, I find it extremely unfortunate that we, as a people, have found ourselves in, a, in the position that we have. I have not had the benefit of reading the controversial, i.e. controversial, only to the extent that I have no doubt my good friend Mr. Hugh would have seen the rich report. I haven't. But I will say this that this is not a, an issue that reared its head for the first time when the judgment, the very same judgment that as I see it gave rise to the commissioning of what is referred to loosely as a rich report. The point system is one that I have never agreed with. I did not feel then, and I do not feel now, that a point system is one upon which a board should be asked to consider in determining whether a person is worthy of being granted the security of tenure, the certainty that 
that is brought with the decision. And for that reason, I can say to you tonight, without any doubt in my mind, we have a broken system that needs to be fixed. Thank you. Mr. Hugh, same question. What do you think of the current immigration policies regarding the granting of permanent residency? And if you were able to decide on policy changes, what would you recommend? Thank you, Paul. You know, immigration is a diff difficult subject no matter where in the world. And um, it, it, it can be also extremely, it, it can also be very discriminatory just by nature. And this is a difficult balance for us as a country. We have to be able to balance the protection and the be able to balance the protection of our people along with ensuring that we protect and provide rights for those who come to live in our country. We have to be able to give people a sense of tenure. We have to be able to let them know what their rights are. And when we came into office, we were faced with a very difficult situation, a situation where laws were passed and not enforced for a couple of years. And we had a deadline looming for some 4,000 people that their work permits were going to expire within a couple of months. We then felt at that time that the point system and extending the term limit to 10 years was our best choice in dealing with A, those persons who had been in limbo, the TLEPs as we refer to them as, they're all human beings, they're real people with families, with plans. And so we had to address those and we felt that the term limit, extending the term limit to 10 years and the point system was the best way to do that. For those who felt that they could not meet the point system, would then have two years to make a decision as to what they're going to do to plan for their future. And for those who felt that they had the amount of points to be able to apply for residency, could have two years to prepare for that. Obviously, there has been issues with that and we have made adjustments, but I do believe that we are on the right track with it. Thank you. We'll start with uh, Mr. Hugh on the next question. The Constitution calls for the establishment of advisory district councils in each district, and a law was enacted to affect to affect that. Would you introduce one if you are elected? Yes, I would. I think I think it's very important that we do that because that will bridge a gap between our constituents and our representatives. I think it's important as we it's probably one of the main benefits of the single member constituency where we can have our, our councils bridging that gap between the needs of the community and their representatives. And so I fully support it. Um, the Premier has stated that once elected or once returned to office that we would fund these district councils. And uh, I think it's, it, it's something I look forward to because it gives us an opportunity to work along with our community and to involve them in the growth of their communities. Thank you. Same question, Ms. Thompson. At the risk, uh, Mr. Pinot, of perhaps being viewed as controversial, if I'm allowed, sir, I'd like to simply in the limited time I, I have to answer a part of your question, just a small part, by way of a question myself. Why do we, as a people, have to wait until the three or four months leading up to our general elections, held once every four years, to recognize that something has to be done, and if we are re-elected, 
this is what we're going to do. I say no more in that respect. What I will say is that I had the privilege since 1992 of serving on various committees in respect to the proposals as a seem relate to what was eventually brought into effect as the 2009 Cayman Islands Constitution Order. I fully support the concept of district councils. But to be frank, in view of the fact that we were then, at, by the stage of 2009, clearly taking the route that we've taken with single member constituencies, I feel that the role of district councils will not be as significant as they would have been prior to the implementation of our constitution because the whole idea, the spirit and intent of having a district council is to hold your representative accountable to those that you have contracted with to provide a service and a voice. Thank you. Our next question, we will start with uh, you, Ms. Thompson, and it's concerning youth programs. What programs can you specifically imagine working in this area, Georgetown North, to get young people trained and ready to work? Do you recommend any specific district programs, and how would you pay for such programs? Well, the second part of your question, how I would pay for these programs, that in itself, I think, is one, to be frank, um, is a question that could take up more, far more time than I'm afforded tonight. In respect to the programs, I, I again have been very actively involved in a number of programs. And I know that this was an issue raised and actually answered by the candidates at the national debate a week ago, 10 days ago. There are a number of programs already in place. I've had the privilege, particularly during career week or whenever I'm invited, I have addressed, I have actually held workshops, or formed a part, I shouldn't say held, but formed a part of various workshops including uh, workshops where young men and women are taught how to write their resume. And to be frank with you, sirs, that is one of the reasons why I think I'm capable of saying that we have to do whatever it takes. We don't have to reinvent the wheel but we have to look at the programs currently in place and see where we failed or what portion or areas that, we may, that may be seen as not being as effective as one would have thought. And that includes, for example, the program that has been implemented for quite some time where young mothers have been afforded an opportunity to be readied to enter the workforce and play a meaningful role. So these are all factors that will have to be taken into account. We have the benefit of hindsight. We now have something that we Thank can you. correct. Thank you. Same question to you, Mr. Hugh. Let me repeat this one. Early. What programs can you specifically imagine working in the Georgetown North area to get young people trained and ready to work? Do you recommend any specific district programs and how would you pay for such programs? Thank you, Paul. Once again, we, we do know that the programs are available. Um, if you take, let's look at Georgetown North, which takes us all the way down to the Ritz. So if we look at hospitality, 
If we look at the School of Hospitality Studies, which we are now in our third year with, in the first year we had a high rate of dropout and, and, and so we investigated those reasons and, and there were simple reasons such as childcare and the ability to get transportation to the program from some of the eastern districts and from some of the areas such as Newlands, etc., where they don't have regular bus service. So if we think about that, my views are that what we can do within our community, and certainly within the District of Georgetown North, is create a mentorship program. When we gather with these young folks, we can ask them what are their interests, and we can discuss with them the different programs that are coming up. This is something I would like to do during the summer, before all of the programs come online in September. And then once we find out what their interests are, my goals are to pair them along with mentors that can assist them in applying, not do it for them, but assist them in applying for the programs, whether they want to go into the nursing program, the secretarial program, the School of Hospitality Studies, or one of the construction programs. And then we have those persons work along with them. So we're taking advantage of these programs that are just about free at this stage to any interested Caymanian. We also have the Alan Moore program, which had to close down recently due to lack of funding. This is a program I've been speaking with Mr. Moore. It's located in the Rock Hole area of Georgetown North. And that program had been quite successful in training young men um, in apprenticeship and electrical work. And then they were all placed, and there's still young men to this day who are still holding on to the jobs, who still have the jobs two and three years later, and are willing to come back and assist in that program. We also have several developments being planned and advertised for the Georgetown North area, and it is my intention to work along with the developers to ensure that proper training is given for persons from the constituency to participate. Thank you. We'll begin with you, Mr. Hugh, on the next question. If elected, would you be willing to accept a ministerial seat? If yes, what areas of responsibility would you want to be assigned? And tell us why. Would I be willing to accept a ministerial seat? Yes, I would. Um, if it's in the best interest of the country. What ministries would that be? There are very few things that I ever profess to be an expert in. Um, I like to joke that I was a toilet paper salesman. But what I do have a keen interest in and where my heart lies is in sports, culture, tourism, and I have a fascination for planning. So between those three ministries, one of those three would be the ones that I would most be interested in, in, acting, in, in assuming the role as minister. Thank you. Ms. Thompson, same question. I think I could answer it simply by saying I have a passion for education, health, and everything and anything that would allow every young man and woman in the Cayman Islands to reach his or her full potential. But I'm going to be very honest and frank. As we sit here tonight, I believe it's premature, and I find it somewhat insulting when I'm introduced to the new Minister of Health or whatever it may be, when the people have not yet been afforded their democratic right to choose their representatives, their voices for the upcoming four years. Let us have our people speak first. Win, draw, or lose. I have booked the Georgetown Town Hall for the Monday before the new government is formed, 29th of May. And that is when I would expect to hear from the people of Georgetown North. And should I be just another constituent, as I have been for the better part of 42 years, I wish to assure 
whether it is my good friend Mr. Hugh or Perlina, who I really would have loved to have had join us tonight. And I understand that for whatever reason she may have been unable to do so. But that is the time for us to speak. And I am going to hold whoever is selected by the majority of the people of Georgetown North accountable, not only to me, but to my children, their children, and successive generations. Thank you. That concludes the questions from the chamber. After this short break, we're going to accept questions from our audience. Please stay tuned. We've already seen how Tier 1 companies bring money into our economy. Now, let's think about how we could help them grow. The easiest way to grow the Tier 1 economy is to help grow the Tier 1 companies that are already in Cayman. So, how could we help them do that? Well, we can make it easier for them to hire more people here in Cayman instead of in other locations. That means providing education and training for Caymanians. And if companies can't find them here, we could let them hire people with the experience and qualifications they need from overseas. Some people think we should go the other way and make it harder for Tier 1 companies to get work permits. But remember, growing Tier 1 companies creates jobs in Tiers 2 and 3 and adds to government revenue. And a job held by a work permit holder today can still be earned by a Caymanian in the future. If we can't promise Tier 1 companies they'll be able to hire the people they need, they'll just create those jobs somewhere else. And if we make it really difficult, they might just leave altogether. And don't forget, work permit holders pay fees and duties just like you and I. The second way to grow Tier 1 companies is to help new companies start up here in Cayman. How could we help these companies get off the ground? Well, the Cayman Islands is one of the few developed countries that doesn't tax a company's profits. Instead, we have a system of flat fees that a company pays whether it's making a profit or a loss. That system works really well for companies making a profit, but it doesn't work well at all for companies making a loss. If we lower the fees for new companies, it would be much easier for a company to start here and get bigger. That's what other countries do, and it works for them. The third way to grow Tier 1 is to help an existing company move here from overseas. Moving an entire company from one country to another is risky and it's a logistical nightmare. We can make it easier by helping them do it. Right now, they're on their own, trying to figure out all the complicated rules in a brand new place. And although most companies around the world could save a lot of money by moving to the Cayman Islands, most of them don't even realize they can. That's why we need to support organizations like Cayman Finance and Cayman Enterprise City that help to attract new tier 1 companies. For now, thanks for watching. And remember to share this video with your family and friends so they could learn more about our economic prosperity engine. Elite Marble and Granite exclusively introduces Santa Margarita Quartz. Elegant and resistant, Santa Margarita Quartz is the ideal surface for high traffic and everyday use. It can also be up to 25% cheaper than Caesar Stone and Sile Stone. Santa Margarita is exclusively by Elite throughout the entire Caribbean with the largest stock in quartz. Call 945-9028 or visit us online at Elite.ky. Elite Marble and Granite, where perfection costs less. Make the most of your morning at Burger King with Burger King's unbeatable breakfast special. Two Chris sandwiches for just $4. Take two bacon, egg, and cheese cr sandwiches, two sausage, egg, and cheese, or mix and match. Add a refreshing OJ or delicious hash browns, plus tea or coffee for a true breakfast of champions. Two Chris sandwiches for just $4, available until 10.30 weekdays and 11 a.m. on weekends. Only at Burger King, Seven Mile Beach, Waterfront, Walkers Road, Town Center Plaza, and now Red Bay. Have you had your Tartuga moment today? Come by Tortuga Fine Wine and Spirits for all your liquor needs and taste the world famous Tortuga Rum and Rum Cake. Baked fresh daily in the Cayman Islands. Enchanting, exotic, and always delicious. 
like the moments you share and will savor forever. The taste of the Cayman Islands, remembering the time of your life over and over again. Such sweet surrender. Looking for quality products with the best prices? Then come to Uncle Bill's. We carry the best bicycle brands on island. You can also make a custom order and pick up items from our great line of accessories. We have a fantastic range of stainless steel, gas, and charcoal grills. And make sure to check out our great line of DeWalt power tools. Plus our newest product, the FlexVolt. Have the freedom of cordless. Come and visit us today. Uncle Bill's Home Improvement Center. If it matters to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Welcome back to the Arts and Recreation Center in Caymana Bay, where we have three, two of the three candidates for Georgetown North, Mrs. Karen Thompson and Mr. Joseph Hugh. We've gone through the chamber questions. Now we're turning the questions over to our, our audience. And we have several questions, so it should be an interesting round. Thanks, Will. Uh, first question is a very, uh, very local question to Georgetown North. Uh, and we'll start with Mr. Hugh. What do you consider to be the most important issues for Georgetown North specifically? Thank you. Georgetown North is, is a very diverse um, constituency. And so whilst it's nationwide, we certainly have issues with employment, continuing to not only find employment, but ensure that our people remain employed and that they have all the skills that they need to remain employed. Crime is certainly an issue we talked about tonight. We hope that with the new commissioner's plan and with proper support that we will see more action taken in patrols. We are missing the community police officers. We would like to see those return. And now we can have our own specific officer for Georgetown North that we can all work along with. I also have concerns about speeding along the West Bay Road. I would like to see traffic calming measures implemented there, in particular along West Bay Road, perhaps raising the crosswalks slightly, as well as putting in islands at the main um, turning points in front of some of the major hotels and plazas, uh, which would also add to the beautification of, of, of the strip but certainly to stop the speeding down the middle lanes and the reckless driving that we see every day as we traverse along that Seven Mile Beach Road. So those are just some of the immediate concerns that I have. Um, obviously on a more national issue, we've talked about the landfill and converting that to a waste energy facility as it sits right in Georgetown North. But those are some of the immediate things that I will hit the ground running with um, once selected. Thank you. Ms. Thompson. Having said that, I think that my good friend, Mr. Hugh and I, are on all fours when we deal with crime, the level of crime, the ever-growing level of crime. We have a very diverse population in terms of our community, not only from an economic, but also from a socio viewpoint. I am of the view that jobs, jobs and more jobs i.e. employment or the lack thereof is an issue that not only faces Georgetown North, but I am concerned in particular as a candidate for that electoral district. I would like to add to that by simply saying, I believe in equal opportunity in terms of jobs for my people 
and I'm a Caymanian, as is Mr. Hugh. So when we refer to our people, we know exactly who we're, we are referring to. And when we look at the statistics, the recently, um, and I say recently, relatively recently released report from the Economic uh, Statistics Office, I have never, to my recollection, um, seen a situation where of our employment force, those currently employed, 47% are Caymanians, as we know them to be, whether by status or otherwise, born Caymanians or by choice. And 53% are non-Caymanians. They're the ones holding the jobs. We've spoken briefly on crime. I feel very strongly as it relates to my electoral district that the sewage, that stench that we oftentimes blame on the, on the dump, clean water, the leaching in the North Sound that we all know about. If you don't know, you can look at it and the proposed dredging of Georgetown. So in some instances, it's what I would do. In other instances, it's what I would not do to assist my people. <clears throat> Ms. Thompson, we'll start with you on this next question. It's a lengthy question, a good question. What plans, if any, do you have to protect the entry-level jobs from being outsourced to developing countries, for example, such as India or Poland? These jobs are usually reserved for students leaving university. I feel that these jobs are being outsourced and it could open a large gap in the local job market. However, Preventing companies from outsourcing could make doing business in Cayman too expensive. It is a very good question. And I'm mindful of the time I've been afforded. And I'm trying very hard to be respectful to my colleague and, and not take up unnecessary time. We have to begin by recognizing that when we are filling positions, we have to also look at it through the eyes of the employer and the red tape and the cost of doing business. Hence, the need in many instances, or I would say the, um, the temptation to look at outsourcing in places such as India. So we have to look at the cost of doing business in the Cayman Islands and ascertain how best to make doing business locally as attractive and cost effective as possible. When I look at a newspaper, and I have not in the last few weeks managed to keep up as I would have liked, and I see an ad in a, newspaper, in a local newspaper dated the 2nd of May, where the deadline for an application for Caymanians and local residents only. So it's obvious that with us in mind. And that cutoff date is the 3rd of May. I think that's vulgar. I think that's an insult. And that is exactly what is faced on a daily basis by our immigration board the work permit board. We have to put the clamps. And I assume from the look on your face, Mr. Pino, that I've probably already reached where you'd like me to stop. Actually, you hadn't. But, May I continue? But, well, not no, really. Now you have. Thank you. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. I'm being guided. So, <laughs> I don't have my watch tonight. <laughs> we'll ask the same question to Mr. Hugh, and I'll, I think I'll have, I should repeat this question. Yes. What plans, if any, do you have to protect the entry-level jobs from being outsourced to developing countries such as India and Poland? These jobs are usually reserved for students leaving university. I feel with these jobs being outsourced, 
the, this could open a large gap in the local job market. However, preventing companies from outsourcing could make doing business in Cayman too expensive. Your thoughts? Thank you, Paul. I just want to quickly talk about some statistics that were mentioned earlier. And, and just to say, to put things in perspective, unemployment in 2012 was at 10.5% amongst Caymanians. April of 2016, it was at 5.6%. And the recent study that was done was done in September, where unemployment amongst Caymanians were at 7.1%. Still not as high, nearly as high as it, as it had been over the previous several years before us taking office. But we do have some work to do, and we've recognized that in particular industries, certainly within the architectural industry, the engineering industry, that we do have quite a bit of outsourcing happening. And all of those fall within our new builder's law, where the second phases will come along that any plans being submitted have to be submitted by a locally licensed architect or by a locally, and as well on the structural side, by locally licensed engineer. The engineers, these are some of the steps we're taking in, in those particular industries. When it comes to other industries and, and um, services that are being outsourced, we can only hope that working along with the private sector and helping them to recognize their responsibility as good civic citizens of the country, that we can work with them in ensuring that our young people coming home from college, and by the way, all of our special scholarship students at the moment, we have made them all register with the National Workforce Development Agency so that we can track them and we can start to work towards placing them into jobs when they get home. And we're going to use programs like the Ready to Work KY, which have already placed 75 people in its first year. Um, which the chamber is a partner in. But we can extend that program for college leavers as well. And I believe it will take the efforts of both the government and the private sector working together to ensure that we have these positions available for our people. Thank you. We'll continue with you, Mr. Hugh. Do you support an annual cap on permanent residency and status grants, and why? I don't. I, I don't know how you would decide then who would be within that cap and who wouldn't be. I mean, there are criterias in receiving these, and there's several different types of permanent residencies. I mean, if, if we are going to issue permanent residency to a retiree who simply wants to come to Cayman, build a home, live here, shop here, eat here, um, and not work, that's a complete different type of permanent residency from someone who has moved here, who have c contributed to the community, who have done their share and have put in the time and are now moving on to the next step. And if you put a number on that, I, I don't know how we would be able to decide who would get and who wouldn't get or whether it be a first come, first serve basis, but I can't think of a fair way of doing that. Thank you. Ms. Thompson, same question. Do you support an annual cap on permanent residency and status grants? Yes, and, I do. And why? I don't think I have any hesitation in saying yes, I do. And the reason for that is simply this. As a small island, we can only accommodate, we can only sustain so much for so long. And it's as simple as that. It doesn't take away the fact that we should be looking at the merits of each and every applicant, irrespective of whether you fall under the category that prior to what was viewed at the time as a significant reform of the immigration law, um, we had what was referred to loosely as the rich man's residence. We didn't have the concept of permanent residence as we know it today, i.e. permanent residence with the right to work. Um, back then, it was my view, and it, I think that there are several reports forming a part of the archives of the Caymanian Bar Association, of which I was a founding member, um, where we looked 
at permanent residency as an alternative to what in 1971 was introduced as Caymanian status. The fact of the matter is, let's call a spade a spade, Caymanian status is simply a mode, perhaps the proper mode, of providing security of tenure for those that have chosen our beautiful islands as their permanent place of abode, if given the choice. Having said that, quite frankly, and I'm not here to debate the law tonight, but the fact of the matter is, as dependents of the UK, we are really not in a position to grant any form of nationality when we ourselves were known then as British dependent territory citizens, now we're British overseas territory citizens. So at the end of the day, I would say that yes, a cap should be placed. And how we achieve that is something that should be looked at a little bit more carefully Thank than you. the last revision. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll continue with uh, you, Ms. Thompson. Yes, sir. What do you think can be done to address the low levels of literacy of high school leavers? Thank you very much for asking me that question. It's one that I addressed just, I think, less than two hours before I came to your forum tonight, in another forum, so it's timely. One of the concerns that I had back in 1992 when I chose to um, chair the committee for the Honorable Mr. Kurt Tibbetts, his first, I think it was, I shouldn't say his first shot at politics, but his first successful shot. He'd run the election before as part of the Three Amigos. Education and the level of literacy at that stage was an issue that I felt strongly about then. We had graduates of the Cayman Islands High School Forget about writing resumes. They couldn't read or write. They slipped through the cracks. And I feel, as I answered earlier, that the way to address that is to ensure that we give our children a solid platform upon which to build from their formative years, i.e. during the primary stage of their education. We still have a problem as I'm sure my good friend, Mr. Hugh, will have recognized in his four years in government. We still have a problem in when we actually have to introduce programs to assist graduates. And in some instances, in fairness, they may not have completed high school. But when you have to try, and I know the chamber has played their role in seeking to provide the skills to improve the level of literacy, to place our young people in the job market. That tells us a lot in terms of the need to do a little bit more than just consider and talk about it. Thank you. Mr. Hugh? Reading that again for me. Sure. What do you think can be done to address the low levels of literacy of high school leavers? Thank you. I think we are working towards the solution. And as we all said earlier, early intervention is certainly the key to this. But if we do find persons within the high school that are suffering from, from issues learning or they are behind where they should be, then what we have to do is to ensure that they are getting the proper attention that they need at that time, that they're getting the proper counseling, or, and that they're getting access to special needs um, services. This is something that we have already started. We have already f um, approved and, and given, a, and we have already increased education budget, my apologies, they already increased education budget 
so that they can return counselors and special needs um, teachers to the, to the classrooms and within the public system. And we also want to ensure that we can have the physical plant built that we can increase the teacher to pupil ratio or decrease the pupil to teacher ratio, whichever way you want to look at it, so that we can ensure that the kids are getting the time from the teacher that they need. But again, early intervention is the key to this. However, when they do make it through the cracks, then we do have to deal with them before we graduate them. Thank you. And we'll continue with you, Mr. Hugh. Why do you think that the following plans have not been implemented or enforced? There are three things listed here. Standards in public life, the whistleblower law, and Vision 2008. Thank you. The standards in public life and the, what was the second one? Whistleblower. Law. The whistleblower legislation. Um, these are some of, the, some of the legislation that this government were committed to bring in to the LA, that we brought to the LA and passed. There are still boards and committees and, and the regulations to be provided for them to be enacted. The Vision 2008, I think we have passed that, certainly in the last four years, and we are now working towards a new development plan um, and a new strategy going forward. We've just spent the last four years catching up on where we should have been. We had the airport, which was totally overcrowded. The bill, it was built for a throughput of about 500,000 passengers. We're currently doing one million. So we're now redeveloping that airport to handle two and a half million. We're dealing with the port, we're dealing with the roads, and I have to say that we're doing all of this without borrowing and without putting the country in debt, but it has been a game of catch up. And now going forward, now that we are where we needed to be, now that our finances are back in order, now that investor confidence has been returned and the economy is stable, we can start now looking to plan for even further than where to Vision 2008 took us to. Thank you. Ms. Thompson. Well, standards in public life law 2013. We have a constitution that our people overwhelmingly supported, went to the polls and voted for. It came into effect. And I believe that, and I stand to be corrected, I know I had many discussions with members of the current government in the days leading up to the 2013 elections. The standards in public life law is actually a law that is mandated by sections 117 as read in conjunction with section 121 of our constitution, if I'm allowed to say it, the highest law in the land. Sitting here tonight in 2017, it is a law that I spent four years as the first chairperson of the Standards and Public Life Commission, actively drafting and assisting in doing whatever I could to have that law brought in, or the bill brought into law. It was passed in 2013. It has been, to my knowledge, amended certainly once and possibly twice. And I am no closer tonight, and neither would any member of this audience, listening or present, no closer that I was when I started on the 15th of February 2009. Why? That is not a question that I am equipped to answer. I can simply say this. If you are not prepared as a member or a potential member of a board to disclose your real or perceived conflicts of interest 
in terms of the board you are being asked to sit on. You shouldn't be on that board. It's as simple as that. That concludes, that concludes the first round of questions from our audience. Please stay tuned. We'll have more questions right after these messages. Elite Marble and Granite exclusively introduces Santa Margarita Quartz. Elegant and resistant, Santa Margarita Quartz is the ideal surface for high traffic and everyday use. It can also be up to 25% cheaper than Caesar Stone and Sile Stone. Santa Margarita is exclusively by Elite throughout the entire Caribbean with the largest stock in quartz. Call 945-9028 or visit us online at elite.ky. Elite Marble and Granite, where perfection costs less. The world is getting smaller. We travel more. We see more. We do more. So you need a bigger health plan like Premier Health. You have easy access to benefits at home. One million U.S. providers accept your ID card for college, vacation, and business travel. With 24-7 worldwide assistance, U.S. pharmacy benefits, and 96% of claims settled in five days, Premier Health offers you the care you deserve. Brit K, where people come first. BritK.ky it's fresh, fresh from the garden, it's fresh, fresh from the baker, it's fresh, fresh from the fisherman, always at her, it's fresh, fresh from the butcher, it's fresh, fresh from the deli, it's fresh, fresh from the summer rain, always at her. At Hurley's, everything is fresh, and we mean everything. Welcome back to the Arts and Recreation Center in Caymana Bay, where we have two of the three candidates, Taryn Thompson and Joseph. We've gone through several questions from our audience, many more to come. So I'll turn it back over to Paul. Sorry, I'm going to As it relates to the development of the port in Georgetown, what contingency plan should be put in place if the worst case scenario of severe damage to our marine life and by extension our per tourism product should occur? Thank you, Paul. I think the studies that we carried out prior to getting this far, there's certainly the environmental impact assessment where we, as promised during the last campaign, we would first confirm that there would be absolutely no harm to the Seven Mile Beach if we were to go ahead with the pairs. We confirm that the Seven Mile Beach currents and the Georgetown Harbor currents are of two different currents, and so that would not be an issue. We also carried out a very detailed environmental impact assessment, an engineering study, and now we are at the point where we feel sure that we can carry out this project without the, any issues regarding further destruction of the coral reefs, reefs or Seven Mile Beach. We have contingency plans in place as far as weather, the timing as to when we would actually be doing the dredging, and of course your normal precautions that you would do during the dredging. But as I said, we are now at a stage where we have extended those piers or the dolphins for the piers to 100 feet. We've gained a couple of hundred yards um, of not having to dredge, and we've reduced that impact by at least about 30 percent. And it's important. If we do not build the piers, we're just going to continue to drop four, five, six, seven anchors in the harbor every morning as Mrs. Thompson said it wakes her up when those chains go down. We can imagine when those chains go down and hit the ground. We've had three or four 
incidents of ships running aground when the winds have changed. So I believe that the contingency plan is to build the piers. Thank you. Ms. Thompson, same question. Should oh, I repeat yes. the question? Would you no, like me to repeat? No okay. need, no okay. need at all. Um, obviously, I wouldn't be privy to the contingency plans as it relates to um, the safeguarding of the marine life and the surrounding area that would fall within the proposed dredging, giving rise to the construction of the two piers. What I would say is that whilst it may sound good to speak about a contingency plan that will protect the Seven Mile Beach area, we have to recognize that the Seven Mile Beach area is, doesn't begin and end in the area that we go on the public beach to swim. Um, in terms of protecting our environment, I don't think that the coral reef and that very, very important barrier reef that is approximately 300, no more than 350 yards offshore. And it runs probably, for those familiar with that area, probably ends somewhere in the area of what we call Linus Bay. Starts just behind my, where I live on the waterfront. And to remove any portion of that reef will change the landscape of Georgetown, the entire district of Georgetown forever. I've gone through Hurricane Allen in 1980. I've been through Mitch. I've been through Gilbert in 88. And more recently, I did, um, not by choice, uh, Paloma preceded by Ivan. I thank God every day for that reef. And my residents of North Rock Hole will do the same. Thank you. Ms. Thompson, if elected, how, how would you address the potential exodus of labor from the country as a result of changes in the pensions law? Well. And specifically in the hospitality industry. Well, I have spoken to not only employees, but employers in the hospitality industry. We all know that this is an issue that has reared its head again since the revision of the law, the pensions law, that will allow pensions to go along with the holders of that pension with a cutoff date that was stated to have been fixed with the hospitality industry in mind to the extent that they would have two years to put in place their contingency plan. That's, that is my understanding. The fact of the matter is, um, it's fine and dandy with the benefit of hindsight, passage of time, we have 2020 vision. I was always, and I, again, I was asked, I think it was then the Honorable Mr. Edward Miller back in 1988, to join a small committee of two others um, to discuss the potential pension plan, a plan that I supported, but I did not feel then, and I, I still feel now, that you cannot speak through two sides of your mouth. You cannot it, let somebody come here invest their money, and then be forced to leave it behind. If they're, be, if they're told that they have no reasonable expectation of staying, and they should be prepared at the end of one year to recognize they have no right 
to an expectation of a renewal for a work permit. I am not sure that with the benefit of hindsight, they should ever have fallen within the law as, it's, no, as it then was. Having said that, I honestly believe that when they leave, they are going, they're entitled to take whatever they have left behind. And I also feel that the mass exodus that is envisaged, or I would like to say, I hope that the mass exodus that is envisaged will not necessarily become a reality. But you Thank can't you. close a cage after the lion is out. Thank you. Mr. Hugh, same question to you. Thank you, Paul. Pensions are, are crucial to our financial independence and retirement. That's, that's why we have pensions. And the, the truth is, the longer the funds remain invested collectively, the better the returns are for all of us. And our pension being quite young, um, just being the law just being passed, I think, in 1998. We have to make these changes as we go along to be able to mature it and to grow the pension as our population grows to ensure financial independence for everyone in the Cayman Islands when they retire. The, I grew up in the hospitality industry. I've worked in the hospitality industry. President of the Restaurant Association for six years. Founding member of the Cayman Islands Tourism Association. I just spent the last four years as councillor for the Ministry of Tourism. And I believe that this one-time exodus that they are concerned about is something that they can manage. manage. We've sat with them, we've discussed it with them, and that's how we came up with the two-year window that they can make their plans. If I were them, I would contact the School of Hospitality Studies and ask them if I can have all of their graduating students over the next two years and replace some of those people with their students. But the truth we told is that they are accustomed to that. They have seasonal workers which come in every year for six months. They won't be affected by this change. And those who will decide to move on, they will have the time to then replace them if they are smart in the way they handle that. We as a government are aware of the importance of the service levels within the industry, and we will be there to assist them in whatever way we can when that time comes to ensure that we do not have issues with the service levels within our properties that our guests are accustomed to enjoying. Thank you. We'll continue with you, Mr. Hugh. Given that the financial services industry is the largest contributor to the local economy, government revenues, and employment of Caymanians, what steps would you take to promote and protect that industry? I think we will, I think as a government, we have certainly broken down the silos between the government and Cayman Finance. I know that the relationship, whilst it's not my area of expertise or my ministry, I know that the relationship at times have been a bit contentious, but the fact remains that the two entities are now working with each other and talking with each other. We've got to, re we have to appreciate that the financial services affects every single one of us. We, we think about lawyers and accountants and trust officers, but for me, what are more important is when we look at the messengers, those, the receptionists, the persons in IT, in HR departments, all of those jobs, the people that, the, those persons that we often forget about. And so I think it's paramount that we continue to work together as a country, break down the silos between Cayman Finance and other organizations, the Cayman Islands Department of Tourism, because we've allowed the financial services to be promoted overseas almost in a negative light. Whilst we've promoted the Cayman Islands from a tourism perspective as just a place where there's beaches and good diving and Stingray City, et cetera, what we have to do is combine the two of those. And we're moving towards that. We are breaking down those silos and talking to each other where we can say we're not just a financial 
Services Center. We're also a beautiful place to come and get married and spend with your family, spend your vacations with your family. But we also want to say that we're not just a beautiful place to get married and spend time with your family, but we're also a well-regulated financial center that you can actually do business in as well. Thank you. Ms. Thompson? I think that Mr. Hugh has made some very valid points, and I um, cannot say that overall I disagree with anything he has said, but I'd like to add my two bits. And that is, we have to recognize that our financial industry plays a significant role in the lives of each and every individual in these islands in some shape or form. It is my personal view that the time has come where we must recognize that we cannot kill the goose that laid the golden egg. In so doing, we have to ensure that the economy is con continued to be built, but with a view to ensuring that the fruits of the labor of that industry is shared across or are shared across the board not just by the top, or if I'm allowed to say, by the fat cats. I also feel very strongly that Caymanians must be provided with the necessary tools and the on-job training to be able to step up to the plate and play a pivotal role in the development of those services. We can no longer just look at the financial industry as a revenue earning base. We have to recognize that we have to place that industry in a position where we're able to compete with international jurisdictions. And that is where I believe as a government we need to focus on the various areas where we as a people can share the spoils, but at the same time do whatever it takes to enhance our bread and butter. Thank you. And we'll continue with you, Ms. Thompson. What do you feel is the most needed component in providing jobs for Caymanians, particularly in the tourism sector? I think that whether it's in the tourism sector or any other sector, education plays a pivotal role in providing the tools to equip Caymanians, including Caymanians who, that have chosen to pursue careers in the hospitality industry. You know, if we look back at the days of the almond tree, there was a relationship as it then existed between our visitors and our locals in the hospitality industry. They saw what they perceived and recognized as a Caymanian. They, I do not think that they have come to the Cayman Islands or those coming to visit in the hospitality industry simply because we're going to build two, t two piers. Yes, we have to provide facilities, but we must equip our people to deal with that which is required in the hospitality industry. We've now, I think, been dubbed K-Mankind. Uh, I'm not sure when that happened, but it obviously happened quite recently. And in order for us to live up to the expectations of our visitors, we need to ensure that when you meet a Caymanian, you leave feeling that warm welcome, 
that those good manners, that friendly face and smile, but also the ability to have a meaningful conversation and tell our visitors a little bit about our history, from whence we've come. And for that reason, I still maintain that whether you're a dishwasher, a cook, or at the front desk in the hospitality world, you must be provided with the tools in order to fulfill your duties and obligations to your employer. Thank you. Mr. Hill? Thank you. The, the key issues for hospitality in, in the hospitality industry, as we know, education is a bonus. But if you were to interview many of the managers, even the managers here now, I've known managers at some of our five-star resorts that started in a towel hut. I recently met with the regional manager for the Kimptons, who started as a bellman. And then they've worked their way up over the years to the positions that they're in now. And the hospitality industry is not for everyone. But what I do know is that our Caymanian people are naturals at it. It comes naturally to them, the smile, the, court, the courteousness, the caring. It comes all natural to us. However, we have to be able to be, we have to expose our younger people, expose our kids to the industry from a very early stage. If we talk about, if we talk about the old pageant beach days and the Gallium beach days and the holiday in days, and when I was uh, you know, working in the industry, visiting Victoria House and Beachcomber and other places, we saw the Caymanian people there and they brought their kids along. You know, we, I went to work with my mother, and I met people, and I learned how to act around them and how to, to be a gracious host to them. Things have changed. The industry has changed. We're no longer Pageant Beach. We're no longer Holiday and We're five-star resorts and on and on. But we have to find a way to have our students experience these resorts, the restaurants, and expose them to that so that they can feel comfortable when the opportunity comes to take their rightful place there. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Hugh, what are your plans for the future of Cayman Airways? Cayman Airways, I, you know, we, we just had last year our first operational profit um, on, at, at Cayman Airways. We were a little bit lucky with the fuel prices, but we did make several operational changes that were instrumental in that, including purchasing our aircrafts so that we didn't have to pay the lease and the maintenance fees that came along with it. We are now in a position where, through proper management, that we are getting ready to upgrade our fleet. We have already had one um, 800 in the fleet, which will be there until we get our four 800 maxes over the next several years, replacing all of the older airlines, which will right away afford us with a 30% increase in efficiency on fuel, an increase in efficiency when it comes to downtime and repairs, which are, which are one of the biggest line items on the expense budget of Cayman Airways. It will also allow us to expand our gateways, which have been a tremendous tool for us in the ministry. And it will give us the most modern fleet, along with our two SABs and the two shorts, will give us the most modern fleet in the region. I think that we are poised, and we all know, or we may not all know, but if we were to want to fly Jamaica, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, I mean, Tampa, uh, Honduras, that the airline could be profitable. It would be much smaller, but it could be profitable. But the way we are using Cayman Airways now is a tool where we are now having Cayman Airways and the Department of Tourism speak to each other. And when, instead of saying, oh, I think it's a good idea to run shopping trips to Panama or run shopping trips to Fort Lauderdale, the Department of Tourism are saying to Cayman Airways, we have identified through our research that there are people in Dallas that want to come to the Cayman Islands, that there are people in Philadelphia that want to come to the Cayman Islands. And so then we put a 
piece of equipment there, we open up that gateway. We have said to Cayman Airways as a ministry, we are willing to pay you $200 a seat to open that gateway. We know that the tourists coming from that area are going to spend an average of $167 a person for six and a half nights, six and a half days. So it makes economic sense for us in that way, and it has been a tremendous tool for our tourism product. Thank you. Ms. Thompson, your plans for Cayman Airways? Well, um, up until this point in time, I don't think I've had very much say in respect to plans for Cayman Airways, but I will say this. I'm extremely proud and supportive of our national airline for obvious reasons. Um, I know that from time to time I'll see various celebrations and anniversaries, but I can recall very well the day we had our first jet came on victory, land at Owen Roberts Airport with a fully Caymanian crew, followed a year or two later by progress. Cayman Airways has had a lot of criticism leveled against the drain that it has had on the coffers of our country. Um, I'm not privy to the figures that my good friend has disclosed, and I'm grateful to hear what he has said. But I will say this, it will be a very, very sad day for these islands if a decision was made by any government to close that na our national airline down or to sell it to a foreign company. We need only we need only look to our neighbors to see what happens when you are dependent on foreign carriers. We need only look at the aftermath of Hurricane Ivan to see what happens when we no longer own a national airline. And I have always maintained that we must look at the big picture. And again, this is an area that I totally agree with my good friend, Mr. Hugh, and that is, you cannot look at the airline in isolation. You must look at the relationship between Cayman Airways and the Department of Tourism and the role that they play. They, they, they go hand in hand. And so whatever I could do to build on what is there, I'm on board. Thank you. Continuing with uh, Ms. Thompson. Do you support or oppose the introduction of gaming slash casinos in the Cayman Islands? I'll speak personally. I cannot speak for my people in this instance. When I say my people, the people that I have offered my services to. I find it very hypocritical to have politicians uh, travel regularly to Las Vegas or wherever gambling is legal and yet stand on a podium every election and say that they're against gambling. I, for whatever reason, have never knowingly, and I think I would do if I did, bought a number, as I hear about the numbers, or played a slot machine. I would much prefer to spend my money otherwise. And to be frank, I don't have an awful lot of it to spend on gambling. I would definitely be the loser. I will say this, it's like the Sunday trading law. We either have a law that bans gambling or we don't. We, in the case of the Sunday trading law, not deviating from your question, we have more ex exceptions to the rule, i.e. the rule of law, than the law itself. I have always felt that with gambling and casinos, 
we get certain things that I personally, personally do not feel that we need. And I have no apologies to make in that regard. Wearing the hat of a lawyer, I have given opinions in respect to raffles. When you buy a ticket for that shiny Mercedes Benz that may be parked in a parking lot, you, it is a form of gambling. It may sound ludicrous to say that, but when we speak of gambling, I'm very heartened that you included the use of the word casinos, because that's how we think of gambling as a people. I am not in support of casinos on this island. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Hugh. Thank you, Paul. I, I am not in support of casinos, um, casino gambling or gaming in any, in any fashion. Um, A, I do not believe that for local lotteries that we have the population to support it. Certainly if government is going to run it, I don't think it will be run efficient enough that it will be profitable. <laughs> Secondly, every instance that I have read about gaming or lotteries being introduced, they've always done it on the backs so of we're going to give them money to education, but in my research I've found that what they've done is replace the education budget with the revenue from the gambling mm. and not added it to the education budget. <laughs> My next point is that if we're going to do it for tourism, we don't need that. Right now, right now during the high season, you can't get a room here. If you can get a room here, it's at the highest average daily rate in the Caribbean by some 20%. So we have a shortage in room inventory. So that is not a concern when it comes to looking at gaming or gambling as a tourism product. We're nowhere near that. We have so many more things we can do and so many more things to work on before we even need to consider that. And finally, in my research, I've found that the only place that the introduction of gambling and casinos have had a positive effect has been in Biloxi, Mississippi where the social ills were already there and there was absolutely no industry so that when they introduced casino gambling even though the social ills increased they now had some revenue to deal with those ills to try and rehabilitate and to try and work with persons who are already facing alcoholism drug abuse home foreclosures, domestic abuse, These, those are the types of crimes. Everyone thinks that you're going to have the mafia showing up in both in neckties and machine guns. The crimes that follow gambling or social ills such as home loss and addictions. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that, that concludes question time. I'd like to thank the audience for excellent questions. When we return, closing statements from our candidates. Please stay tuned. Is getting smaller. We travel more. We see more. We do more. So you need a bigger health plan like Premier Health. You have easy access to benefits at home. One million U.S. providers accept your ID card for college, vacation, and business travel. With 24-7 worldwide assistance, U.S. pharmacy benefits, and 96% of claims settled in five days, Premier Health offers you the care you deserve. Brit K, where people come first. BritK.ky Welcome back to the Arts and Recreation Center in Kamana Bay, where we have two of the three candidates for Georgetown North. We've gone through chamber questions and many questions from our audience. Now it's time for closing statements, and we're going to begin with Ms. Mrs. Karen Thompson. I would like to take my two minutes to thank the chamber. I would like to thank Hurley's Media, 
and I would like to thank you both for this opportunity. I think it's been a very helpful exercise, not only in respect to those here tonight, but those that may have chosen to remain at home and have an be afforded the opportunity to hear the views of two of the three candidates offering our services to a district that we obviously love and feel very passionate about. As I should also add in that regard that as a self-funded, 100% self-funded candidate by choice for the district in which I reside, I am welcoming every opportunity that is, has been afforded to me to speak to my people without having to pay for it. So I'm going to say again, thank you. At the end of the day, when the decision has been made by the people of Georgetown North and the democratic process has worked as it intended to work, you will have one representative. And when I say you, each, of, each district will have one representative. I feel that I am able, I feel that I possess the vision, I feel that I possess the experience, the humility, and the ability to represent my people. And in so doing, I do not choose for one second to take away from Mr. Hugh what he has to offer. Thank you. Mr. Joseph Hugh. Thank you, Will. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. I, being a formal president of the chamber, I know the work and the hard work and the um, sacrifices that you have to make in putting on these, these uh, forums. In fact, it was 2005 um, because of the chamber forums that I had my first date with my wife. <laughs> and so I will never forget these. Uh, I also want to thank um, the audience for coming out and supporting us, a wonderful turnout this evening. And for those of you who have tuned in uh, on the televisions with us and watching, um, we appreciate you taking the time to watch and we hope that we were able to provide you with the answers you were looking for. Will Paul, I have been a part of a government that I've been proud of over the last four years. We've returned stability to the country. We have restored government finances. We have restored investor confidence. We have driven unemployment down. We have reduced the cost of living. And I just want to say that I have absolutely no regrets in deciding to put myself forward four years ago to serve the people of Georgetown now, and the Cayman Islands. Now, in this current election, Georgetown North was a natural choice for me. We live in Georgetown North. My wife is a Parsons from Dixie, several generations from Georgetown North. I grew close to Georgetown North over the year, year, years with my involvement in soccer programs when I ran soccer programs from the annex, working with kids out of the swamp and rock hole area. And Meals and Wheels, which is another charity which is dear to me through my Rotary Club. I spent a lot of time in the area. And so I am asking the people of Georgetown North that I would like the opportunity to continue to work along with them for the next four years, especially under the single member constituency that we can work side by side with each other to build a great community. Thank you. I'd like to thank the candidates and our audience and I'll turn it over closing remarks to Paul Biles. Thanks, Will. On behalf of the Chamber Council, we would like to extend a special thanks to both candidates for participating in tonight's forum and to the audience who have taken the time to attend as well as to submit questions. We hope that the voters here this evening and watching at home feel more informed about the positions of these candidates. 
I'd like to thank Hurley's Media for broadcasting tonight's forum live to the Cayman Islands public via Cayman 27. And I would also like to thank our supporting sponsors, the Dart Organization, Deloitte, Foster's IGA, Heritage Holdings, and Puritan Cleaners. The next candidates forum will take place on Thursday, May 11th at Georgetown Town Hall. The Georgetown Central candidates will include Mr. Marco Archer and Mr. Kenneth Bryan. Remember to visit caymanchamber.ky for news on the elections and our forums. You can find voting and voter ID collection locations on our website as well. Thank you for supporting the Chamber Debate Forums. Good night and safe travels. to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Welcome to Let's Talk Sports, brought to you by Elite Marble and Granite. My name is Jordan Armanis, and we've got an incredible show for you in store. Let's take a look at the lineup. All right, batting first, he is running for the Cayman Islands Athletic Association presidency. Bernie Bush is in the house. Bernie, thank you for coming. Good for Bernie. All right, coming on second, they had an incredible under-15 youth football cup. The organizing West Bay Sports Foundation, Arden Rivers and Mervyn Smith in the house. Thanks for coming, guys. And my island pals, my amigos, my bros, Sean Kaner Kane and Paul MC Whammer, as well as the Baron of Hockey and Football, Matthew Ian Sloan, here to talk about the NHL playoffs. Guys, thank you so much for coming. And of course, we got football focused with the Baron. A great show for you in store. This is Let's Talk Sports, brought to you by Elite Marble and Granite. Waste Carriers is your complete waste management company. We service commercial, residential, and construction properties. With our large inventory of dumpsters and grapple truck services, we provide an unmatched, dependable service. Our sister company, Island Recycling, buys and collects recyclables such as AC units, aluminum cans, auto batteries, copper, and much, much more. For Cayman's Waste and Recycling Solution, one call takes care of it all. Call 946-DUMP. That's 946-3867. Seven Mile Beach Resort and Spa. Have you heard? They have new daily meal deals at Popeyes. A different meal with sides every day of the week for the same price of just $3.99. Monday is chicken soup with rice. Tuesday for hush puppy shrimp. Two tenders on Wednesday. A loaded chicken wrap on Thursday. It's all about that shrimp on Friday. Chicken nuggets to start the weekend. And the mixed two-piece to finish. The new daily meal deals from Popeyes. A different meal every day served with the world famous best dressed chicken for only $3.99. Only at Popeyes, Louisiana Kitchen on Eastern Avenue. with lime juice, olive oil, soy sauce, and brown sugar. 
Leave the salmon to marinate for an hour before broiling for 6 to 10 minutes. Season the asparagus, drizzle with olive oil and place in the oven until tender. Drizzle with the sauce from the pan and enjoy. Hi, I'm Darren Brooks. I play Wyatt Fuller on The Golden Beautiful. Watch me cause trouble weekdays, only on Game of 27. Welcome to Let's Talk Sports, brought to you by Elite Marble and Granite. My first guest, he is running for the president of the Cayman Islands Athletic Association. You've been there before, and you will try to claim the position again. Bernie Bush, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about the Cayman Islands Athletic Association. Bernie, we'll start off. Uh, we spoke with Lance Barnes last week. He told us why he would want to be president. Now you have your chance. Why now? Um, especially at a time when I'm in the middle of a run for a political seat uh, for my district of West Bay. It's, uh, it was not an easy decision, but this was made some time back when a lot of young people, some of the former national athletes, and a lot of parents, and people who have been diehard track people for a while came to me and said to me, we are in a mess. And even though I'm a paid up member and I go to most uh, AGMs and so forth, I didn't realize how bad it was until a lot of them sat with me, showed me things that were happen happening. And the thing that really got to me is when parents came to me and showed me, my child qualified. This child did not qualify. This child was taken on, the, on to represent. My child was not. And that is a cardinal sin that you don't do. And that was the reason that, re that was the final straw that spurred me to say, okay, I'll come back once again and try to straighten the association out because there's a lot really wrong and please elaborate what do you think is are on the top of the list if you're elected what what has to change to make it a an organization that you would uh, be happy to lead well one of the things you have to do almost everyone that's there now should go if not everyone because they've all been part of the problem and you want to change uh, what's happening but some of the same people who have made the mess are running again and when you look at what happened with the fiasco with Ronald Forbes not getting to the World Championships, when you look at, once again, other young people not uh, qualifying and not getting to go to games, there's a lot of sins that have not come to the public's view because we've tried to, uh, because of sponsors and so forth. But then, take a good look. How much new or major sponsorship has come into the association in the last two or three years? Not to the association. It's gone to a private track meet, but not to the association. And that's where you have so many conflict of interest within the association. And one of the things that uh, you have, I've learned over the years is you try to get people who love the sport, but not necessarily have a child in there at the moment, because at times it can, uh, you can get conflicted and people will accuse you of stuff that's not even there. And uh, to me, we have not really branded our athletes, our good athletes. Uh, you have a young lady, Miss Barnes, who people see her getting medals in uh, track. But what most people don't know, this child is also, or this young lady is also a valedictorian. And, Speaking about Lacey Barnes. Yes. And you have other athletes like herself. And what are you hearing? Only when they go away to a track meet, get a medal and come back. What is being done otherwise in between that for these type of athletes who are scholarship material? And when I was president before, at that time, we had a stream of people going out and, uh, on athletes, uh, on athletic scholarships, whether it was partial, some full, but that's what we have to get back to. So we're talking about promoting the, good, the athletes that are succeeding and giving more athletes an opportunity that you feel are not being given opportunity because of, of people's inter personal interests. Correct. 
Now, what specifically, now we talked about this earlier, what specifically can you do if same people are elected that are, you know, the supposed issues that are being created, if they're keeping their positions with the new organization, how can you affect change? But if the same people get back, I don't think the next government will prop them up like this present government did. And uh, they were warned. Uh, I myself personally warned uh, people in government what was happening. And uh, a lot of people who are there are there for the wrong reasons. I'm sorry. They want to, because of the flights, to get to travel this way and get travel that way, uh, travel all over the place. And um, one of the things we also have to do concerning the athletes, in track and field, it's a little different. It's time for us to go to where you get individual coaches for individual events. Right now the track clubs have gotten so big and there's so much talent that the coaches are being stretched thin. And those who are supposed to be doing coaching, I was just told by two different schools that they asked one of the people that's getting paid to do track to come to the school for the last two years and they've yet to show up. So these are the kind of things that we'll have to stop. Bernie, I gotta cut you off. Will you come back and speak further if we, uh, if I invite you back next week? Because I feel like we're just uh, scratching the surface here. I have no problem. Uh, next week, kind of busy, but I'll make time for it. All you. right. It was great having you on. Lots to cover, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for having. Me. This is Let's Talk Sports, brought to you by Elite Marble Granite. Stick around. We got more show next. Some side effects of radiation can affect a patient's appetite. Here are some tips for maintaining good nutrition while undergoing treatment. Eat frequently. Eat small portions of calorie-dense foods. The goal is to maintain your weight while going through therapy. Concentrate on liquids and soft foods. These will be easier to swallow. Although it may become difficult to eat, try as best as you can to maintain good nutrition. Visit the local Cayman Islands office at Governor Square or call 749-3304. Get ready to laugh as TV's funniest hidden camera show will have you in stitches. Just for laughs, the Laugh Out Loud comedy show catches unsuspecting people in some of the funniest situations. It's just for laughs and it's only here on KMN 27. Australia's best anglers go head to head in this premier tournament, the Australia Fishing Championship. This popular fishing show sees the country's best casting their lines across the outback. From the freshwater lakes and rivers to the spectacular tropical waters of the coast, these fishermen try to reel in the biggest fish out there. Watch on Cayman 27 Sundays at 7.30pm and Thursdays at 1pm to see who lands the biggest catch. Have you had your Tortuga moment today? Come by Tortuga Fine Wine and Spirits for all your liquor needs and taste the world famous Tortuga Rum and Rum Cake. Baked fresh daily in the Cayman Islands. Enchanting, exotic and always delicious. Like the moments you share and will savor forever. The taste of the Cayman Islands. Remembering the time of your life over and over again. Such sweet surrender. Welcome back to Let's Talk Sports, brought to you by Elite Marble Grant. And my guest at this time, he's the co-founder of the West Bay Sports Foundation. They just put on an incredible football tournament. That's the Cayman Airways Under-15 Youth Football Cup. Mervyn Smith is here. Mervyn, thoughts you. on the tournament? We were, we were absolutely ecstatic. You know, um, it went as planned again, and very positive results. You know, we had a, one of the teams from the region actually winning the tournament against the mighty Manchester City. So, all in all, we had the support from the fans and all the sponsors, so we're quite pleased with the event. How, how did, what was some of the feedback that you got from some of the, the different coaches and coaching staffs and players about the tournament? Again, they were, we were pleased. Everyone is we were very comfortable, enjoyed the tournament, enjoyed the, you know, the exposure. It was good. It was good for the Cayman Islands on the 15 national team as well. What, the, what it presented to them, the opportunities to, you know, not only play against a higher caliber of team, so to speak, but also, you know, the interaction with people, those people that uh, make a difference, you know, in, in terms of aspirations and where they want to go and, and, and to achieve the highest level possible. You know, uh, that, that type of interaction is just priceless. So 
So with Cayman, you know, one win, two losses, three points total. Do you think that uh, their success directly affects the tournament, or is it more of just being around other good teams, being in a CONCACAF, you know, style tournament with other regional teams? Like, how does Cayman affect, uh, did they get uh, benefit from this tournament? Obviously, there's sports tourism, right. and of course, the exposure. So what were some of the benefits when coming together to put this tournament together? Obviously, the caliber of competition is very high. And again, that's what the tournament, that's what we at the SBA Sports Foundation set, to, set out to achieve, to bring the highest level of competition possible for our youngsters to have to face. So, you know, the fact that, yes, they won one, but they lost two, you know, it's one of those things where experience and the losses, you know, real boards well now going forward. And, again, when you look overall at the tournament, you know, Manchester City being here last year, won the tournament. This year, Cuban national team, I want to congratulate them. For, for the effort that they put out. Great, they beat, great game. Yeah, they beat Manchester City 2-1. So, you know, from, from a regional standpoint, and of course speaking about our own team, you know, it shows that we can compete against such a team of such a high caliber. So, you know, overall we're very pleased with that. And, you know, going forward, we intend to, again, attract the best, the highest level of competition we can for our youngsters to face because it, it can only improve them overall. What did you think of the final? You know, 2-1. Uh, pick, a pickpocket, you know, by the Cuban midfielder, mm -hmm. basically ended the game with a few minutes left. What did you think about uh, it? Very, a very, very, obviously a very exciting final. And, you know, one of those things where, again, we're pleased to see uh, that a team from our region has won the tournament. You know, um, it, it, again, it, I, can't, I can't really overstate the importance of the, the level of competition. And, and to know, now, for our team, it came on national team. Yes, you too one day can get to a point where you're winning this tournament because we are not lowering the competition you know we want the highest possible level of competition we can get and again to expose them to that they know now cavaliers as well as jamaica and then we had to train that national team as well hey one of our teams has won this tournament it bodes well going forward manchester city hopefully will be returning next year again and we were looking to improve all the time in that aspect of the level of competition and our under 15 national team being right in the middle of it they can win a game from it really quickly guys